Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Ibology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic pro-drug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. If you'd like to support the show, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Before getting into today's episode, I just wanted to let everyone know that since this podcast releases four new episodes a month, there will not be a new episode next Monday, April 29th, but we'll pick back up the following week on Monday, May 6th. With that quick announcement, let's get started. Today's episode is on the article titled, Increase in Taste Acuity with Sympathetic Stimulation, the Relation of a Just Noticeable Difference to Systemic Psychotropic Drug Use, published in 1966 by researchers at Ohio State University. Let's start by getting an overview of what the researchers were examining. Previously on the podcast, we've seen a few studies looking at changes to visual perception, which makes sense given the very apparent visual changes produced by psilocybin in particular, and psychedelics more broadly. But what these researchers wanted to examine was whether or not psilocybin also produced changes to our taste perception, also known as gustatory chemoreception. They also wanted to see how any change in taste perception produced by psilocybin compared to changes produced by phenothiazine drugs, a class of antipsychotic medications, and changes produced by tricyclic antidepressants. Getting a bit more specific, they examined how these drugs may influence our taste acuity, as measured by determining a participant's just noticeable difference threshold. As it sounds, a just noticeable difference, sometimes abbreviated as JND, is the amount of something that needs to be changed in order to notice the difference. Let's go through an example that's somewhat relevant to the study. Let's say you are cooking a meal and added 50 milligrams of salt to it. You gave it a taste and wanted it to be just a tiny bit saltier. If you just added 5 milligrams more, you might not notice that you really added any salt. But if you kept adding a little bit more, eventually you will notice the difference. Let's say that it takes adding a total of 15 more milligrams of salt before the meal tastes any saltier. This would mean the just noticeable difference is 15 milligrams. You can then take the JND of 15 and divide it by the baseline amount of 50 milligrams in order to calculate what's called the Weber ratio or Weber fraction. In our example, the Weber fraction would be equal to 0.3, which can also be expressed as 30%, which is how the authors will present these data in their paper. This means that the amount of salt that needed to be added in order to produce a change in taste compared to the baseline was 30% of the baseline value. Although not always perfect, this rule of thumb holds true as you increase the baseline value. What I mean is, if the dish you were making started out instead with 100 milligrams of salt, you would need to add 30 milligrams in order to notice a change in the taste, instead of just adding 15. The goal of the study was to determine if different drugs can change this ratio, which is essentially a measure of taste acuity. A lower ratio represents an increase in taste acuity, because less was needed to be added in order to detect a change whereas a higher ratio represents a decrease in taste acuity, because a greater change was needed in order for that change to be perceptible. Although they don't cite much background research in their introduction, this is largely exploratory, they do mention that they have observed changes in taste acuity produced by amphetamines and antipsychotics. Specifically, that taste acuity increased in response to amphetamines and that the taste acuity decreased in response to antipsychotics. Because both amphetamines and psilocybin share some sympathomimetic properties, meaning that they both stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, the researchers hypothesized that psilocybin would similarly increase taste acuity. In order to test their hypothesis, the researchers assessed participants' ability to detect changes in taste of solutions containing sodium saccharin, an artificial sweetener. They first provided participants with a reference solution of a given sodium saccharin concentration and confirmed that participants could taste the sweetness of this reference solution by having them distinguish between distilled water and the solution. 
They did this by giving participants four cups of distilled water and four cups of the solution and asking them to sort which contained just the plain water and which contained a, quote, sweet solution. Once the researchers determined a good reference point, they then repeated the procedure, but this time by giving participants four cups of a sweet solution, which they called the reference, and a sweeter solution, which they called the comparison. They again asked participants to sort these two solutions. Now, the first comparison solution was reportedly 40% more concentrated than the reference solution. From what it sounds like in their method section, if participants correctly distinguished the comparison from the reference, they then decreased the concentration of the comparison solution by 1%, meaning that the comparison would then be 39% more concentrated than the reference solution rather than 40% more concentrated. They would keep decreasing the concentration until participants could no longer distinguish the two sets of solutions. Now, if, however, participants could not distinguish between the reference solution and the initial comparison solution that was 40% more concentrated, they would then increase the concentration to something like 70% the reference solution. From there, if participants could distinguish the two solutions, they would then start to decrease the comparison by 1% meaning, again, that the new comparison would be 69% sweeter than the reference solution. This process would again be iterative until participants were unable to distinguish between the two sets of solutions. It's not the most clearly laid out methods, but hopefully you get the general process. The goal is to determine how much the comparison solution has to change in order to be distinguished from the reference solution. That way they can calculate the Weber ratio. Before getting to the results, I want to make a couple more notes about the methodology. For the trials involving psilocybin, five healthy male participants, which is a very small and homogeneous sample, completed the experiment once without any drug at all, and then again 90 minutes after being given psilocybin. The researchers also noted that in order to familiarize participants with both the drug and the experiment, they all completed a test run after being given psilocybin two weeks prior to the actual data collection. As for the trials involving antipsychotics and antidepressants, these utilize samples of patients who either were or were not being prescribed these drugs to treat various mental health problems. This places some unique limitations on our interpretation of the results, which we'll discuss as we go through the findings. So starting with the trials involving psilocybin, what the researchers found was that the Weber ratio for the healthy patients before being given the drug was on average 48%, but 90 minutes after drug administration, that average went down to 34%, and this difference, despite the small sample, was reportedly statistically significant. This means that while on psilocybin, participants had an increased taste acuity and could detect smaller changes in concentration of the artificial sweetener. This supports the researcher's primary hypothesis. The second aim of the study was to see how this compared to how antipsychotics and antidepressants changed taste acuity. To do this, three additional sets of trials were conducted. The first compared Weber ratios between patients who were being prescribed an antipsychotic and patients who were not being prescribed an antipsychotic. They found no difference in Weber ratios between these groups which averaged somewhere between 59 and 64%. Now, although this might suggest that antipsychotics do not influence taste acuity, it's possible that there's a confounding factor here. For example, because patients were not randomly assigned to medication or no medication, it's possible that patients with more severe pathology were the ones being prescribed medications in the first place, and perhaps more severe pathology is linked to a greater degree of altered taste perception. If that's the case, and the antipsychotics were actually helping reduce their symptoms, then we might expect patients being treated with medication to more closely resemble a less severe patient population who may not have been prescribed medication. Although that might sound strange or a bit like a stretch, we have to remember that there are many mental health problems that are absolutely accompanied by hyper or hyposensitivity. Now, the next trial conducted was between patients being prescribed antipsychotics and patients being prescribed antidepressants. Similar to the previous finding, the researchers again found no difference between these two groups, 
with ratios averaging between 60 and 64 percent. Finally, the last trial compared patients who were not being given any medication and healthy controls not given any drugs. Here, they did find a difference, specifically that patients had a higher average Weber ratio of 59% compared to healthy controls with an average ratio of 49%. What's kind of interesting is that it appears that patients, regardless of being on medication, all had Weber ratios around 59 to 60%. This is about 10% higher than healthy controls not on any drugs, and about 25% higher than healthy participants given psilocybin. It's not clear what meaningful implications this has, but I still found it interesting nonetheless. The authors tried to make the claim in their conclusion that taste acuity could be a proxy measure for clinical status, with higher ratios indicating worsening health outcomes but I definitely wouldn't go that far based on this really small and limited study. The idea is, of course, provocative, because it would speak to developing a somewhat less subjective diagnostic tool, but much, much more rigorous research would be needed to examine whether this connection is tenable. The authors also seem to make some other fairly unsubstantiated claims in the paper, at least based on the data they had on hand. One example is that in their discussion, they claim that their results, quote, indicate that tranquilizing drugs, since they produce hypothermia, must diminish the metabolic rate and thus increase the size of a gustatory Weber ratio. Personally, I'm not sure how they were allowed to even publish their paper as it was currently written, because their results don't appear to show a difference in response to tranquilizing drugs first off, and at no point do they ever measure metabolic rate or the presence of hypothermia. There are other statements throughout the paper that just seem very speculative, and don't seem like they belong in this scientific paper. Overall, this is one of those studies that was interesting to come across, but only because I think it makes for good psilocybin research trivia knowledge, not because I think it adds substantial information to our understanding of psilocybin. In addition to not being very informative, I also worry about the ethics behind their methodology. Since they don't describe their consent process at all, I'm particularly concerned about how they recruited their patient population. They only state that they used, quote, acutely ill female mental patients from the Ohio State University hospitals. Granted, tasting a sweet solution isn't a risky experiment, but my concern is more that they may have also been part of other experiments by the same research lab, some of which may not have been as innocuous. One final note that I wanted to make about the paper is that they did mention a few anecdotes that were interesting particularly for the healthy controls given psilocybin. They noted that they observed participants who came into the study with an already more sensitive taste perception seemed to have an even further reduced Weber ratio than those who came into the study with less taste acuity. I'd be interested in comparing the changes in taste perception when you administer psilocybin to, say, the general population compared to chefs or those who more regularly use their taste perception. Anyway, with that, that's it for today's episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the podcast, please let me know. You can find out all the ways to reach me on the website, psilocybology.org, or you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. Thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you next time.